Good morning. Welcome to your Tuesday morning meeting. I'm Dr. Robin McKay. And today we are talking about how to shift from distractibility into focus for those of you who are leaders, CEOs, um, spiritual entrepreneurs, regular entrepreneurs, anybody who thinks that they have ADHD is going to benefit from listening today. And um, if you're new, say hello in the comments. I'd love to say hello back. And if you're not a member yet of my actualization zone over on the Facebook, um, come and join us over there. It's my free group. And I love to connect with and work with intelligent, intuitive leaders who are ready to who are ready to create a new world for themselves and other people. And one of the things that is really important for creating this new world, this new life that we want to be living is focus and attention. And that's one of the things that I think that we are sorely and profoundly lacking these days. I read in a, an article recently over on Attitude. It's the, it's the website for ADHD. They had done some research just on their readers, just on their readers. And among those people who read or subscribe to Attitude Magazine, something like 23% of them had been diagnosed with ADHD in the past year. I think that, um, you know, one of the consequences of the pandemic, staying at home, all of the things that our bodies, minds, and spirits have had to endure over the past couple of years have created the conditions for the masks to come off. In the past, perhaps we were able to mask some of the symptoms of ADHD a little bit more easily, but when the physical body reaches surge capacity, when you tip into burnout, it becomes very, very difficult to mask some of those milder symptoms of ADHD that might have been not been seen so regularly or um, intensely before the pandemic. So here we are. And it's one of the reasons that I do these Tuesday morning meetings is to give us some direction, some sense of direction and some encouragement around managing our minds, bodies and spirits so that we can not just be productive. You know what I think. We're not clones. We're not cogs in a great machine. We are human beings and we are creator beings. And we are people who want to do good work in the world, want to make contributions, are here to master some things as well, to make meaning and purpose out of our lives. And all of those deeper seated heart's desires that we have can be held at bay simply because we're unable to focus. So today I wanna to talk about distractibility in particular, but as you know, if you've been with me for a while on these Tuesday morning meetings, or if you listen to my podcast, Mindset Rx, this is something I've been talking about for a while now. By the way, October is ADHD Awareness Month. So if you would like to have me come into your organization and share what I know about the mind-body-spirit approach to to addressing symptoms of ADHD, shoot me an email. We'll put that my email in the show notes, but just for your information right now, it's Robin, R-O-B-Y-N at drrobinmckay.com. And we will figure out the best approach for you and your organization. If you've got a lot of people uh, who are identifying as being neurodiverse, and specifically around the ADHD piece. I think that this is an important part for organizations to start, start taking a look at and supporting their people so that you can get the best out of your people so that they can have the experience of being a contributor, being happy, satisfied, enjoying working at your organization and you and your organization benefit from their innovations and their creativity. All right, so today is about distractibility. And as I was preparing for today's meeting, what I was thinking about is my own approach to my own distractibility and what I recommend to my top executive clients who work with me privately as well, many of whom actually have ADHD as well. It doesn't necessarily mean that you're not going to be successful if you have ADHD. In fact, what I have found is that there are many, many very successful, accomplished people who happen to also have ADHD. So we know that it's not necessarily a rate limiting step, but it is definitely something I think that we've all started noticing more now than ever before in terms of how we're conducting business, how we're leading, 
and the effect of the distractibility on our lives, whether we're at work or at home with our families. There's distractions everywhere. So I'm, what I'm not going to talk about is something that everybody talks about, which is eliminate distractions. Just a little bit behind the scenes, as we speak, I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten tabs open on my Chrome today. And that's just on my Chrome. And I share this not so that you can judgy, judgy me, judge me, but I was going to say judgy McJudgerson. Don't be that, but maybe you can relate. We have so many bits of information that are coming at us every single millisecond of every single day. I can hear in the background in my husband's office, he's got CNBC playing in the background. Um, I've got distractions on my desk. I've got my Oracle cards and I've got my notebooks and I've got my cords for my computer. So there's just so many distractions. And so perhaps I could take a bit of my own medicine by saying eliminate distractions, but that is one hack that's very popular in social media, when I'm seeing people who are coaching on ADHD, one of the things they're going to say is eliminate distractions. However, with people who have ADHD, eliminating those distractions, needing a clear desk or wanting a clear desk and actually making it happen are very two different things and are often very difficult to accomplish. So rather than talking about eliminating distractions, which ironically I just did for the last minute or so, what I want to talk about is that we have a tendency, I think, to blame ourselves for our distractibility. In other words, and it can even tip into gaslighting. If I weren't so distractible, then dot, dot, dot. If I weren't so distractible, then I wouldn't have been late on turning in my assignment. If I weren't so distractible, then. And there, there becomes this internalization of what I'm going to say just ballparking. Let's just even say you're only 50% responsible for your distractibility. What if your environment is just naturally distracting? I mean, certainly you can leave that environment to some degree, but we're all attached to our phones. We all have multiple tabs open on our computers. Probably even as you're listening to me, you're also doing something else. And there's actually nothing wrong with that. In fact, doodling has been shown to increase retention of mundane information about 30%. Not that this is mundane information, but it does serve to focus attention if you happen to be doodling or taking notes during this meeting. So what I thought I would do today is talk about some of the things that have worked for me and that I recommend to my clients in terms of distractibility. And I'm gonna do a three-pronged approach. I'm gonna talk about body, mind, and spirit. Body, mind, and spirit. And even if you're not, even if you're just like learning about spirituality or learning about energetics or learning about some of the, the things that are have kind of been swirling in the ethers for a while now around, around spirit, what I wanna do is just encourage you to just have a listen. If it doesn't land for you, that's cool. Do the other things. But I have a sense, especially with uh, people who are leaders who also happen to have ADHD, I have a sense that most likely you probably have a spidey sense. You probably have an innate intuition that maybe you don't talk about very much. Maybe you don't acknowledge very often, but it still remains there. And that's something that in order to bring focus to your life that we have to start bringing online, both at home and at work, even if other people feel like it's too woo, even if other people feel like it's too touchy feely. I really, I'm at a place in my career where I just don't care anymore. I'm just going to do the things that work for me and that I know work for me and that I know work for my clients. And that's why we are here today. So let's take body first. So to eliminate distractibility, when I think about body, I also think about behaviors. What are some things that we can do to support the focus that you're wanting to create. Behaviorally, there are those hacks that usually we talk about when we are, when we are, um, I'm just noticing my connection is, oh, there we go. Okay. I just got talk about distractibility. I just got a notification that my, my, um, Wi-Fi wasn't great. It looks like it's back online though. Okay. So there, there are those hacks that we talk about the behavioral things that you can do 
the physical things that you can do to support your nervous system, which is largely responsible for focus and also largely interacting with our distractible world, which creates that feeling of distractibility in your mind. I can't focus, you say. And so we have the behavioral piece for that. So a couple of things that I found worked. One is regular exercise. And I'm not talking about just like walking for 15 minutes. I mean, vigorous exercise. For me, that has worked. Walking is also good, but I always find my mind drifting when I walk. So when I work out, I work out with uh, at the gym uh, a couple times a week with a trainer and he's focusing my attention. He's bringing my attention back into the present moment by having me lift weights, by having me run intervals, by having me do these behavioral shifts in order for my body to get stronger, for my lung capacity to get more, have more capacity and so on. So I know exercise just makes good sense. And you're probably saying, well, I don't have time for that or you know, I have good intentions, but I don't do it. And that really largely comes, at least in my life, it came from making a decision that I was going to prioritize it. I don't know how a better way to say it than that. It's just, it was a decision that I made. It was an internal shift that I had to make in order to be able to work out. And now I work out six days a week. Okay. So exercise, even if it's walking, Another body piece for you to look at in terms of distractibility is hydration. So we want to make sure that you've got a lot of water on board. I find that most people aren't drinking enough water and the quality of the water actually matters too. So making sure you've got the purest quality water. I use one of those Berkey filters in my house to filter my water and that it tastes like silk. It's amazing how how good that water tastes. And then I also use electrolytes in my water. So I have a brand of electrolytes that I like to use. I'm happy to share that information with you. If you would like me to just leave a comment and we'll pop uh, the link in the comments for you or in the show notes for you to take advantage of that. If that's something that you want to try out, not attached, but it does work for me. It's, I drink electrolytes in my water all day, every day, and I don't use Gatorade. I don't use anything that has a lot of sugar in it because that's another body thing that we can do to support our focus, to support attention is to eliminate or reduce sugar as much as possible. So between the, the hydration, the electrolytes and the exercise, those are really important pieces for me, for my clients, maybe for you too, to be able to start focusing your attention. All right. And then I was going to say one more thing about body. Oh, sleep. So sleep hygiene is another really important behavior or body piece to the attention puzzle. I like to take a magnesium supplement at night before I go to bed. Um, it's the magnesium works with the nervous system to calm it. And it almost always ensures that I get a good night's sleep. If you're not getting a good night's sleep, chances are you're going to be more distractible, more irritable than you would be if you got a good night's sleep. So those are some really simple things to do for the body that are going to support the focus and attention that you're wanting to create and not eliminate the distractions necessarily externally, but definitely eliminate a lot of the noise internally that you might be experiencing simply because the nervous system is running too hot. It's tired, it's overwhelmed, it's overloaded. So all of these practices are going to be supportive of the body and the nervous system. The last thing I will say about the body, I know this is a lot of information, information about the body, but stay with me here, is to, is to adopt a mindfulness practice. Now, you don't have to sit for 30 minutes and do a mindfulness practice, but even if you're meditating for five minutes a day or 10 minutes a day, just bringing the focus back to your breath, just a mindfulness practice, bring it back to the breath. You're actually, it's like doing push-ups for your prefrontal cortex. So you're actually exercising your attention and focus, bringing yourself back into the present moment. Your attention, your focus, your creativity, your flow all exist in the present moment. If you are not in the present moment, it is very difficult 
to stay focused. When you have squirrel brain, it's very difficult to stay focused. So the mindfulness practice of just bringing your attention back into the present moment, focusing on the breath, focusing on moving from moment to moment to moment, stopping, looking around, looking in your environment, noticing what it is that you see, bringing yourself back into the here and now is another vital practice to restore your focus and attention. Okay. All right. So that's body. I have, you guys, I could talk forever about just the body stuff, but I want to get to these other, these other prongs of the, of the attention and focus. So after body, now I want to talk about mind. And with the mind, what I want to do is talk about psychology in particular, because when somebody has either a diagnosis of ADHD or even if they don't have a diagnosis, but they've had all of these symptoms and maybe they have anxiety, maybe they've got some symptoms of depression. When we have that experience over time, we internalize a lot of these problems and we keep asking the question, what's wrong with me? What's wrong with me? And when you internalize that enough, you can go into a shame spiral. You can go into a guilt spiral. There can be some trauma involved with that as well. There can be some confusion. Why am I this way? Why can't I stay focused? Why does Susie, you know, at my, in the cube next to me, why can she stay focused all day, every day? And anytime somebody comes up behind me, I'm distractible Debbie. Why is that? What's wrong with me? So when I talk about the psychology or the mind aspect of staying focused and bringing your attention into the, the present moment. What we have to look at is looking at the psychology behind the stories that you tell yourself. There, there are a lot of ways of doing that. You can do that in therapy. You can do that with a healer. You can do it with somebody who really has a good grasp on the, the psychology of being human, really. So I'm not saying necessarily that you do need to go into therapy, although I'm a big advocate for therapy. I worked as a therapist for a long time. I don't do that anymore. I do executive coaching. Um, but there, are, one of the things that stands out for me, for people who have ADHD, from my experience and from the people who I work with, is that there is a sense of I'm broken. Why am I broken? And the world that we live in has a tendency to say, if you're broken, let's give you a pill or let's put a Band-Aid on it until you're fixed. We look for a quick fix because that's what the culture around us tells us. However, what I will say is that it's my experience that the, the inner work that you do, the deeper you're willing to go with yourself, to understand yourself as a human being, to understand your strengths, your abilities, to understand your psychological makeup and to start healing some of these past experiences that have influenced how you feel about yourself, the stories that you tell about yourself, the perhaps low self-esteem, the perhaps imposter syndrome, the perhaps questioning whether or not you're actually even capable of doing all the things that you say that you are, the people pleasing, all of those are seated in the personality, in the psychology. And so while some people might say that you can change these things behaviorally, what I have found to be true is that the, the, the more time you take with yourself to explore your inner world, to understand who you are, your perspective shifts. And the perspective shift is one of the best ways I know to, it's a curative factor really, when it comes to focus and attention specifically, and overall just that a kind of global sense of who, who I am in the world and what am I meant to be doing here? So we've got to, rather than putting band-aids on the psychology, it's probably time for, for us to start looking a little bit deeper than that, going deeper into who we are as humans, as people, and feeling our feelings and resolving some of these past hurts that have created an even greater dis- disruption in our attention and focus. Okay. I know it's not all rainbows and sunshine, is it? 
And, you know, going deeper and doing the inner work isn't for everybody. But if you, I really believe this, if you actually want to have not just a quick fix, not just a Band-Aid, not just a tablet you can take or a, you know, a, a thing that you can do, a transdermal patch you can put on in order to focus, that is a short-term fix. The long-term, the long-term solution is going to be a deeper look at yourself as a human. That's the mind part. That's the psychology. All right. How's that? How's that landing? And then the last piece I want to talk about is the spirit piece. You know, I wasn't diagnosed with ADHD until later in grad school when I was working with a bunch of gifted girls who happened to also have ADHD. And I was like, wait a minute, I resemble that. And I went through the whole testing process. And sure enough, um, it was a confirmation of what I had suspected, which was that I do have ADHD and it happens to be the inattentive type. Now, early on, I did get a prescription medication to treat the symptoms of ADHD. And I did find that to be very helpful. It allowed me to not have to deploy so much of my intellectual resources to focus, to pay attention. I could sit in my chair, I could do my work, and there weren't a lot of the past distractions. I could feel my nervous system was much more focused um, than it had been previously. However, what I have learned since then is that I prefer to not use prescription medications to treat the symptoms. And one of the reasons that I've been able to do that is because of the spirit work that I've done, the energy work actually that I have done. And this actually started long before I was diagnosed with ADHD. I was working in the pharmaceutical industry. I was a medical writer. I was responsible for huge documents that were sent to the FDA. I had to have attention to detail. I had to focus. I had to stay on task. I had to do all these things. And literally, because I was still, I was working in an environment a cube environment actually with lots of people around me. It was very difficult sometimes to stay focused. So the energy work that I started doing 20 some years ago now called Reiki was really my first experience using energy work to focus my attention. I have a colleague who says that energy work is the new mindset work. And I have to agree with her. I think that <sighs> And, you know, everything is made of energy, first of all, whether you can see it or not. I also know that people who have ADHD tend to be, not all, but tend to be more sensitive to subtle energies, to energies that you can't see, than people who don't have ADHD, who are more neurotypical in how their brains are, are wired. Um, I also know that from my own research that a lot of people with ADHD are also highly creative, highly intuitive people as well. So taken together, we have to pay attention to the energetics of what's going on in our physical environment, what's going on inside of us, and use energy, channel basically channel energy, in order to clear our space, to clear our palettes, to clear our fields, so that the, 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 the subtle energies that might be creating distraction in your energy field, in your bioenergy field, just this little magnetic field around you, are cleared. And once those are cleared, it's so much easier to focus. And when what I learned, I remember the first time I ever did this, I was working on a clinical study report. And it almost felt like an audition for a company. I was working at a contract research organization at the time. And I really wanted to get a job at one of the, the bigger biotech companies that was my client at the CRO at the time. And it felt a little bit like an audition, but I also just wanted to do a really good job on it. So I used Reiki. I used this energy modality every single day when I'd sit down to work. I would send energy to my project. I would send energy to myself. I would send energy to the final project. I would envision the final project. And do you know what happened on the other side of that? First of all, I was able to focus. I was able to sit in my seat and do my work. I didn't feel that um, that sticky, icky, jumpy energy of distractibility. And I was just able to sit and be. And as a result of that, I actually was hired by that biotech company that I went on to work for, for about five years as I was finishing up my PhD. So 
whether or not you're an experienced practitioner of energy work, or this is the first time you've even heard of such a thing and you kind of are going like, let me find Google. What I will say is that there are a couple of different energy modalities that I work with. One is Reiki. I've used Reiki for 22 years at this point, maybe even longer than that. Um, but I also use the Akashic Records, and that actually is now my go-to in terms of the, the energy work that I'll do uh, for myself, for my clients, for my projects that really keep me focused and on purpose with those projects. It's very subtle. It occurs at what I believe is a subatomic or just an energetic level, but it is enough to focus my energy attention and to, to support the, the highest and best productivity, to support the highest and best creativity. So with that, I wanna just invite you to breathe in and breathe out and move around a little bit. And maybe you can even, as I've been talking about these energy modalities as the spirit part of the mind-body-spirit approach to increasing focus and attention, maybe you started to notice something in your system. Maybe you started to notice a little bit less agitation. Maybe you started to notice a little bit more focus, a little bit more calmness. And if you did, that is the energy working. And if you didn't, that's cool too. That's cool too. It doesn't, I'm not attached either way. I just know that for me and for my clients who are very bright, very intelligent, very accomplished, very intuitive, these are the modalities that work best for us as well. All right. So with that, I'm going to close for today. I'm so happy that you are here with us. If you found this, this Tuesday morning meeting helpful, leave a comment, let me know. I'd love it also if you would share it with your network and be sure to tag me in it so I can see and so I can say hello and thank you. Until next time, I am your host, Dr. Robin McKay, and I will see you later.